Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. I can't tell you how excited I am to have Deborah Brown here from New York City. And I can't tell you how excited I am to have her work here. It's amazing that we got it to Birmingham. I'm in love with the work. I hope everybody enjoys seeing the exhibition. Tina is the curator at AVA, assistant curator at AVA. And Tina tonight is going to have a little conversation with Deborah, and Deborah will give everybody a little bit of an insight into her work. So, yes, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, Deborah, first, I just want to welcome you to Birmingham. I'm very excited to see you here. And so, some of y'all may or may not know, but during the quarantine, we did this series for Ava called Face to Face. And Deborah was one of the first videos, uh, interviews that I did uh, via Zoom. And a year later, we're sitting here together, and it's really exciting. The series that is on view here at Scott Miller Projects is her shadow paintings. So that's mainly what we're going to be focusing on. So Deborah, I want to just ask you if you would um, tell us how this series came about and why was your personal experience over the last year important in developing this body of work? Well, first, thank you for having me. Thank you, Scott, for everything you've done to put on this beautiful exhibit. This gallery is just a jewel box. I don't know if... Maybe you ha don't know how lucky you are to have someone with uh, the knowledge that Scott has of the art world bringing artists from all over and local luminaries to his gallery. I think it's a real, uh, it should be a point of civic pride that a community would um, support a gallery like this. I think it's really fantastic. So, and I really appreciate Tina being the knowledgeable person that she is, um, stepping up to interview me and that we've had this relationship develop over the last year. But uh, to respond to that specific question, I am an artist who lives in New York, where I've been for 40 years. So I consider it my home. Um, and I have a studio in Brooklyn in an industrial business zone. So I own a warehouse that is in the midst of all these other warehouses that mostly um, do things with materials in a kind of old, like 19th century way. It's a very old economy there. You would never really know that the new economy has come to New York in the form of high technology and all of that, because this neighborhood has no stoplights. It's about five square blocks in Northeast Brooklyn, and um, excuse me, Northwest Brooklyn, and it's close to Manhattan, but it, it's zoned so that you can only do kind of manufacturing uses there. So it's a bit archaic, and it's filled, the streets are, um, are uh, filled with these one-story warehouses with really long vistas, and after everybody goes home from their factory shift, it's often pretty deserted, except for the presence of these really colorful murals, um, which are done by street artists with the permission of building owners, usually. So there's this incredible kind of um, like funhouse weirdo, joker kind of aesthetic that's on the walls of these buildings and as you walk around in the solitude of them uh, seeing down the streets in these long vistas there are these really weird um, and very brightly colored um, graffiti and street art things going on around you so in the midst of covid when none of us could really go beyond the immediate parameters of our uh, lockdown spaces uh, i would go out to walk my dog uh, several times a day, and this is really the landscape that I saw. And so the early paintings that I started um, at the beginning of the pandemic had snow and the long shadows that are cast in the wintertime, which are really eerie. They make you look almost like a Giacometti figure, you know, extending infinitely into space so that you occupy a very small, real physical space, the space you're standing in, but your shadow is infinite. And I thought that had a lot of uh, and the shadow of my dog. Metaphorical possibilities, especially in light of the erasure of most of us and our companions and everyone in our community uh, from our visual environment. I mean, we really were solitary figures in a kind of existential relationship with the landscape. And I thought these shadows and this very eerie neighborhood, uh, the combination was kind of a a good representation of, I think, the isolation I felt and maybe that others felt as well. Yeah. And so I think it's, um, you call it kind of eerie, and it is kind of interesting because you live in New York, so all of us 
that have been to New York, we're used to seeing hordes of people. And so it is kind of eerie to know that it's really just you and your companion trout and um, <laughs> walking around kind of isolated all alone. Um, and so my next question is, um, in a lot of your past works, the female figure is very prominent. Um, and your companion trout is really the central figure of these works. Why did you decide to omit the more little, literal human figure and represent yourself only as a shadow? I think artists' works sometimes develop almost by accident. I, I um, have always painted things that are around me, and I had been painting um, myself, the things in my interior spaces um, immediately, in the work immediately preceding these paintings, so I had taken my environment as my subject, and I think one day I was out walking her, and I saw um, there are a bunch of people living in camper vans in my neighborhood, believe it or not. They live on the street in a van, a big van, like a Winnebago, and the Winnebagos are also covered with graffiti. Uh, and I saw my shadow cast on the ground with trouts, and then this brightly colored van with the graffiti and the wall of graffiti behind it, and I just thought, that's a really striking image. Um, and I took a picture of it on my phone, and then I got back to my studio and I started to think about it, and I decided to paint it, and it just kind of, I'm not sure, it was just, it was, a, it was not a directed intellectual idea that I was gonna pursue shadows or, uh, you know, like be a sort of representation of Camus and existential crisis and things like that. It was, it was a visual image that just struck me, and I think it became um, an obsession for me to paint this in all the different incarnations that I saw it as I walked around my neighborhood subsequently. It just, I got captivated by this idea of representing myself as, a, as an absence, only present by my shadow. And then it led to all kinds of interesting um, visual possibilities because I began to portray Trout, the dog. I found her on Troutman Street, so she's a rescue from the neighborhood in a really realistic way, at least realistic for me. So she pops out of the painting the leash comes forward, the leash is you, you're, you're, I mean, you're holding the leash, you're in the painting, and this shadow is really you, any, anyone, it could be any person. And so it was genderless, race blind, age blind, and it, I think it, it struck me as having this more universal, I think, appeal that it really could, anyone could relate to this, and it, I think that's what struck me is true that it had a certain authenticity to our experience because it seemed true to me. I mean, yeah, anybody that has a dog, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or a cat, some cats walk on leashes, um, can definitely put themselves in this situation, which is something that, you know, I have four dogs, so I very much resonate with, you know, walking trout. Um, so uh, there's also a long history of artists, you know, who paint their companions and did, any of these like historical figures like throughout art history come into mind when you thought about painting your dogs? And I know that the shadow paintings aren't the only series where you've painted your companions. And so I'm wondering if any of that is tied into your work. You know, in painting these paintings, I think I had other influences that were not related to artists who've worked with dogs like um, Giacometti, Munch, Edvard Munch, who yeah. is a Norwegian artist, some of you know is known for the scream, like who painted really long vistas that, um, De Chirico. But as far as dog painters, I, the great painters like Velasquez and Manet have painted dogs. And um, Velasquez, because he was a court painter, painted them in the context of um, the kings and princes and queens that he represented. These were the attributes, the dogs of their, um, their wealth and prestige and um, pedigree. And there's a really striking painting by Velasquez of the young, one of the young princes who, because the families had intermarried so much, was doomed to die at an early age. Um, and he's portrayed with a, a little lapdog spaniel. And the dog looks very sad. And he's beautifully painted. And you sense that death is the subject of this painting. The dog knows he's going to die. The kid knows he's going to die. The artist knows. The family knows. And so this really sensitive portrayal of the consciousness, not just of a human, but of an animal, I think really resonated with me and how paint can portray that. Like yeah. the greatest artist could paint anything, but I think that painting by Velasquez, and there's a great Manet painting of a, another kind of floppy lapdog that's beautiful. Those are, are paintings that I looked at, but I, I mean, I think in terms of the structure of the paintings, the compositions, what I was trying to get at, 
I think I feel a lot of rapport with German Expressionism, Max Beckmann, um, Kirshner, um, uh, Monk. Yeah. Uh, the perspectives, the, the zeitgeist, the feel, yeah. are the ones that I'm really drawing on to construct the paintings. And German Expressionism is one of my favorite time periods. I love the use of color, which is something I also love about your work, is your use of color and the use of shadows. And it's not just a black shadow. It's Sometimes it's blue or purple or gray, pink. Um, and I, I know that also relates to the time period. And so, so you can see the seasons changing in these paintings. And if you look at the lights or the trees and the way they're blooming or not blooming, and then even your clothing, like why is it important for you to sh show the passing of time in this work? I guess as I stuck with the subject matter, I thought that one of the ways to have other iterations would be to be sensitive to those things. So I started to bring in the trees, which in the earliest paintings were just branches that uh, mingled with the um, shadows of the light stanchions and the stop signs and the telephone poles. That's a big part of the architecture of the paintings too, are these man-made things that are in juxtaposition with the Dionysian graffiti. There's this Apollonian structure, which is the man-made structure. And that's a constant in the paintings, is that this dichotomy between what's man-made and what's um, uh, natural. Yeah. Like, and so the trees became a bigger part of that. And at one point, this neighborhood is actually really pretty ugly. And so when the trees are blooming in New York, that brief period in April, they're just, I mean, like Van Gogh, like pink and white and beautiful and gorgeous. And I thought I should try and see if I could incorporate how there's this kind of yin and yang between what's beautiful and what's ugly and mingle them. And it also gave me the chance to work with different forms. And um, I, I began, I mean, I began to see the paintings as kind of a chronicle of a year yeah. because you don't have the winter paintings, but a lot of the winter paintings have snow and people's footprints, and some have figures in the distance as kind of stick figures that you you know you're, you might be seeing a stranger, someone way down this long vista, and they have a different feel. They feel more hunkered down, like that that the landscape is unfriendly, yeah. and then spring comes and it's this kind of venturing out and more joyous, and um, and so the the natural forms and the color of the blooms interact with the graffiti and there's this sort of dance that they do I think in the paintings. They do and we I think most of these are probably from spring and early summer um, and I've seen the neighborhood it's not pretty but you do make it look very <laughs> beautiful <laughs> um, and so uh, the next one of my other questions is so you really kind of center us in your landscape. And so you take us through a journey through your neighborhood. So I just wanted you to kind of touch a little bit on the importance of showing the viewer these different areas of your neighborhood, because obviously you know where they're at, but we don't. And so, um, you know, what's the connection and why is it important to take the viewer throughout the neighborhood? I think artists show you what's in their head. It's always like the most interesting work I think is both really specific and comes from that artist's gut, mind, heart, whatever, but is also universal. And I'm not saying that I make a claim to that, although I try to, but I think I have a real passion for this area. It is, um, it's good. It's like I can, I think of it as a land that time forgot because it's a very archaic use group for this, what's going on here. There, it's, it is, People are making things like they did a couple hundred years ago. It's like, I mean, wontons, steel, uh, mushroom. There's Mr. Mushroom. There's a pickle bottler. There's the tin bangers, the, the HVAC guys. We call them the tin bangers. I mean, it's like all these really industrial uses, and they're only 20 minutes from Manhattan. And, you know, all these one-story warehouses. It's just kind of hard to imagine this economy still exists very close to New York, and the city wants to keep it close to New York for the jobs for lower skilled workers and more working class people. So it has a protected zoning it can't be built on for housing, which is what's kept it this way. And it's just, I mean, nobody goes in there who doesn't have some point to be there. It's just a kind of a, like an inert gas that, you know, nobody really goes in or out. It's just like operating on its own. And it's just fascinating because it has this really special look. And I think I've just fallen in love with it. I feel really lucky to have my studio there, to own a building there. Um, it's, I have a lot of affection for it, even though it's it may be because of it's very gritty. Yeah. 
and, and harkens back to another time because Manhattan, as a lot of places, is so, before COVID, so much the playground of very wealthy people and there's a lot of building and, uh, I mean, it, this is like, a, this is the anti that. It's just so co totally in another zeitgeist. And I have a lot of, I mean, it, it inspires, like, it's kind of romantic, it's probably ridiculous that I have these feelings, but visually it's very interesting and I think it, it conjures up these feelings that have become these paintings for me. I mean, you're really kind of documenting a part of history, your history specifically, but this neighborhood, you're making a documentation of that for, it will probably eventually change, even if you can't make it housing, but painting over the graffiti or people coming in and re, you know, remodeling things. So you're kind of marking it. Well, what's interesting, there's another artist who's much more famous than I, Josh Smith, who did a series of paintings of this neighborhood during COVID, because his studio, he also owns a building around the corner. He shows, I think, at David Swerner or, so. yeah. yeah. And so he, sh he gave interviews saying he thought this area was really ugly and it was so dirty and blah, blah, blah. But he did paint a lot of the same, you know, I recognize the buildings that he was, was referring to and, I, and had a big show of this work in London. And I thought, like, he scooped me. How could he do this? You know, he doesn't really love this place like I do. So anyway, it does seem to capture a few artists' imaginations. <laughs> So one thing that has really drawn me to your work on a personal level is I love the mixture of the figuration and the abstraction because your brushwork is very loose and some, some things are left to the imagination. Can you talk a little bit about this mixture of style and like why it's important to kind of leave some things up to the imagination? I think it's taken me a long time to learn that lesson, but as I, I think maybe it was because I was painting other people's paintings, because the graffiti, the street art, is in a way someone else's artwork, yeah. very much so someone else's artwork, and so I have to take liberties with that, but I think to the broader question, I think what painting does is it's a series of languages, and what's interesting to me is to try and combine different languages, different ways of representing things, because as an artist you have total freedom, and I thought the most interesting part of these was the way that some things are portrayed much more realistically, in, uh, like trout, and other things are wacky. I mean, represented in a much more of a shorthand and uh, is not logical. And so combining them, which is hard, not anything goes. I mean, you do have to figure out how to put it together, became my task. And I thought that was really what made the visual excitement in the work is to try and get that to cohere. Yeah. And I began to abbreviate more and more in some of them just to see like what kind of things you needed to do to telegraph X or Y or Z and how much you could reduce it to a more symbolic function, the mark, the image. Uh, and did that tell a different kind of story? Because then as a viewer, you're invited to kind of deconstruct that, those different languages. And um, I think it gives you an entry point. I agree, and I think um, it's really interesting. You can see in some of these you've painted a little bit tighter, painted a little bit more realistic in terms of the graffiti art, and then others, it's very loose, it's very much left up to the imagination, so you can kind of see that progression just within the works in the show. Um, and so my last question is, um, like, why was it important for you to show your work here in Birmingham and to m make your visit here? I don't think I would have come for just anybody. <laughs> I think, I mean... I'm kind of ending where I started. I think Scott, where you are, is the man. I found out about him through a conversation that a German, a Berlin art dealer of great renown, he was having this conversation, a series of conversations with collectors, curators, artists on Instagram, Instagram Live, and Scott was one of the interviewees um, as a collector. And I was just really impressed and I wanted to find out who this dude was. Um, so I think I reached out to Scott and I got to know you. And so Scott is like an internationally known guy. And I think you probably, maybe you don't know this, like how knowledgeable he is about art from, that's going on in a lot of places. And um, I thought that if he, and then he, Scott decided to open a gallery fairly recently. Well, I think this has been a dream for, of yours for a long time, but the announcement was public, was only fairly recently, and I just got a hold of him and said, you know, I'm interested. <laughs> so it dovetail came together, Scott was enthusiastic back, and 
it's just, it's a real honor for me to show um, here in this beautiful city, which I gather has a great cultural history as well, but I think it, an artist has to match with the right person as a gallerist, and I feel really lucky to be working with Scott, so that's a big part of the reason I'm here. <laughs> well, I can say that he equally is honored to be working with you, so. <laughs> Thank you, audience. <laughs>